And let's start with the overview. And we are going to start with a why should you care about stochastic optimization and risk? And, and, and probably there are four main points. Uh, first, that uncertainty is really pervasive in most of the situations we encounter. Uh, and there have been big changes in the last 20 years regarding what we understand by risk and algorithms. And actually, all that relies on things that most of us already know how to do, which is just solving this deterministic optimization techniques. And that's great. And we are going to move on to a simple example showing these ideas. And then we're going to get into some details on risk. And then we're going to talk about how you actually deal with problems where the stochasticity is not discrete, but in a general setting, OK? So let's start with why should you care? And as I was saying, really uncertainty is pervasive. Uh, I mean, if you think in all kinds of applications like energy, nowadays, if you are doing energy planning, you know that the rain patterns, the winds, the sun are really important and, 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 and decisive when, when you are doing planifications on energy uh, income and consumption too. Uh, in finance, which is probably the old example that everybody remembers, is the return of the assets. I mean, it's not really a known quantity. It, 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 it is usually modeled as a, a random variable. Uh, in retail, demand, of course, is never really known in advance, and, and you have to make decisions before you know the, the, the demand realizations, and, and, and in services in general. I mean, all the arrival times, processing times, all those are uh, sources for uncertainty that you have to deal beforehand it's reveal and and of course the literature acknowledged this and 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 there are all references dating back to dancing at the very beginning of the field of or talking about how to deal or try to approximate uh uncertainty in optimization models and also risk. I mean, risk has a long history. And, and as I was saying, the, 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 the finance models is probably the oldest and best known one. Uh, and Markowitz, uh, his key insight in 1952 was to approximate the idea of risk through the uh, variance of the random returns. And, 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 and it was by that word that he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And, but all, not only that, I mean, there is also work, very old work on uh, utility functions on, from von Neumann and Morgenstein uh, quite early in the history. Uh, however, I mean, during all that time, this view of risk is, lacks consistency, really. I'm going to be precise of what I mean by that in, in, in a short while. And, 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 and what is really new is that in the last 20 years, I mean, there is a very nice uh, axiomatic definition of, of risk that will make sense in, in, in most settings, I will say. And not only that, actually, you can characterize these risk measures uh, with simple convex functions. And, 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 you know, I mean, if we do optimization, we know that convex functions are nice and good to have. And actually, uh, it's one of the key things that the, these kind of measures of risk are uh, end up being very amenable to optimization and, and can be incorporated in easily in the models. And that's one of the things I'm going to show in, in this webinar. Uh, not only that, not only we have a better understanding of risk and, and, and good ways of expressing risk, also in the last, again, 20 years, uh, simple algorithms, just like sampling your uh, stochastic problem uh, has been developed quite a bit. Uh, probably the first one to call it like a sampling algorithm like that it was clean within 2001. And, and the nice thing is that these algorithms really apply both to discrete and continuous distribution, so they are very general. Uh, they also allows you to compute true upper and lower bounds on the stochastic optimization problem that you're solving by doing approximations, uh, where you control how much work you're going to do, and I'm going to talk about that too. And, and actually, it's not only that they converge on the long, long run, they, they, they usually convert very quickly for most practical problems, so that, that's very compelling. They all rely just really solving all deterministic problems. I mean, if you have an LP with stochastic uh, data and objectives, or maybe even constraints, if you use the right kind of uh, measures, they will still be an LP uh, when you incorporate the risk into that. And also, it's the same is true for MIPs. And the only thing that you will be paying up is the problem size that you are going to solve. But fortunately, I mean, modern solvers are very, very robust regarding size, and I'm going to show that. And, and only that, I mean, the whole point of getting bounds, uh, it, it's very easy to do the prioritization on that. It's just trivial solving several problems uh, at the same time. 
Uh, and what you end up doing is really solving what is called the deterministic equivalent problem. And I'll be showing what I mean by that. Uh, I mean, there is no way to pack all the interesting and fun things uh, that's been happening in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years in stochastic optimization and risk. Uh, the community is very active, and in my opinion, it's the most active community within optimization. Um, there are specialized arguments to deal for large scale problems, where, where large is, I don't know, 10 to 100 uh, uh, realizations and stuff like that. Also, on dealing with uh, multi state stochastic problems, there are already powerful applications using industry. This is not just academic, uh, especially in energy. And probably my most dear example is the Brazilian uh, electricity energy. Uh, where they are solving uh, 120 multi-stage stochastic problem with risk aversion as objective, and they are using the solution actually to take decisions on the energy, how is price in Brazil. That's really neat, and that's been going on for several years already. There are also many new algorithmic ideas being tested and developed, uh, and, and, and actually, I mean, incorporating risk usually, it, it, it's a better approximation of reality. And as I was saying, I mean, there's no way to pack all the new stuff into one webinar. So please do spend some time in the Stochastic Programming Society website, which whose address is, is right there in the slides, okay? So let's move on. I mean, I hope that you are engaged now about why should you care? And let's start doing some stochastic optimization with a simple problem. And, and probably the simplest problem to, to think about is the news vendor problem. Essentially, the problem there is that you have to decide today how much inventory to carry. And tomorrow, depending on what demand you see, you will sell uh, something. And, and of course, you also have a decision to make on, on scrapping whatever inventory is left. And, and there is some Classical economic parameters like the procurement unit cost, how much you have to pay today to get a unit of inventory to sell. There's the selling price, uh, which is the, the full price that you will get uh, for selling a unit to the customer. And then the liquidation price, which is whatever you earn or actually may have to pay uh, for taking care of whatever inventory was left. And, and this is a very well-known problem. And if you've done an MBA, this is uh, what they show. And actually, you will know that this problem uh, has a closed form solution. But I mean, in reality, there are many more things going on. I mean, you will have recruitment costs that will depend on the volume. You will have multiple selling channels. And each channel will have probably a different uh, price that you will see. You will have liquidation subject to capacity. You will have multi items. And they will be sharing either the, 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 the capacity to store staff. And you have substitution of items. And, and you usually in reality will have many more things. And the beauty of using optimization and not just a closed form is that you just can embed all those stuff into your MIP or LP framework. And that's the true power of this, of doing optimization with stochastic information within the framework of uh, MIPs and LPs. And you just add that. Uh, anyway. Just to fix ideas, I'm going to go back to the simple case. But remember, I mean, the whole point is that you can solve harder problems uh, using these techniques. OK? So just to give some uh, naming fix. First phase of the decision in a stochastic optimization problem is whatever you have to decide before the stochasticity is revealed to you. In this case, it's the inventory that you have to buy today. That will be the first stage decision. And that decision cannot depend on a specific realization of the demand tomorrow. A certain data or random variable data is going to be the demand in this example. And But you may argue, actually, that the selling price may be also uncertain and the liquidation price is also uncertain. Uh, in any case, the, these kind of techniques will be able to handle those too. We're going to stick on the simple case on where demand is uncertain, OK? And there's something called the second stage variables, or variables whose actual value can depend on the uncertainty that you saw. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be whatever quantity you're going to sell tomorrow and whatever quantity you're going to scrap tomorrow. Okay. And as I said, the decision 
second stage decision can and should depend on the realization of the uncertainties. And one very odd thing now in the setting is that what's the result of the problem? It's really not just a number. It's really a whole distribution of uh, final uh, losses or income. And for example, you may get something like this. You will get a distribution of values, uh, this is, these are losses. So negative values are good, positive values are bad because you are actually paying at something in these cases. And you will see some density on the possible outcomes and some cumulative distribution uh, on the probabilities, okay? And just to fix ideas, whenever I show these kind of graphs, uh, the box plot here is showing the medium value here and you have the 25% up and lower uh, density, and then you have the 95 and 5% uh, density of the distribution, and then the 5% upper tail and lower tail. That's what you will be always saying. So the question is, given that the outcome is really a random variable, uh, a distribution, if you wish, how to value that? Uh, and, and just keeping it simple, let's start just talking about the expected value, which is essentially just the average loss that you will see. Okay, and we could use that as an objective function. And we will go in using that in this case. Okay. But 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 keep in mind, I mean, this is not really incorporating risk. This is just transforming a, 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 a random variable into a number just to get evaluation. Uh, we'll be talking about risk shortly. Okay, so if you do that, then the problem will be written like this. So you will maximize the expected value. Uh, you have some constraints into whatever you sell. You cannot sell more than whatever you have in stock and whatever is the actual demand. And you cannot discount uh, more than whatever is left after the sales from the starting stock. And you link the actual uh, profits with the cost of procurement here and whatever you're earning by selling and whatever you're earning by discounts, okay? However, I mean, this problem in principle is really an infinite dimensional problem. Why? Well, because the demand, if it is continuous, uh, you should have one constraint for every point in the demand. So this really get nasty. Uh, and, and, and so, and, and, and only that, I mean, you have an expected value and that's really an integration. And again, how do I integrate an optimization? That's more like a control problem. So let's keep it simple. Let's assume for now that my demand is really discrete, okay? And if the demand is discrete and only discrete, but a finite set of realizations, a given set, a finite set, then everything really simplifies a lot. And so we are going for the short while, right? for most of the presentation, assume that our stochasticity is really given by a finite set of possible outcomes. Uh, and in that case, now the constraints is used indexed by the number of scenarios that you have or possible outcomes and all the integrations just resume into a sum, a linear sum. And it's just a very large LP. So this is nice because we can deal with this problem. And actually, if you do the uh, modeling in Python, you'll see something very simple. Uh, it's just those lines and you're good to go. And this problem, I mean, even if you, you can actually simplify a little bit the formula. So we, before we had this idea that you could choose between the total demand and the order quantity and the discount you could choose, I mean, Assuming that the values that you get here are positive, the best solution would just to say that the order quantity is going to be split between sales and the demand, and that the actual sales should not exceed the uh, demand in every scenario. So this is a simple model, and this is what I'm modeling here. Okay, and just to fix ideas, I'm going to always use uh, for these examples 10,000 uh, samples of possible realizations of demand. That's what I'm going to use, okay? So the cardinality of this set I is going to be 10,000, 10K. And in this example, I'm going to sample my demand from a normal distribution, and this is the kind of information you will be seeing for them. And if you solve this problem, 
uh, you'll be surprised. Actually, I mean, this has 20,000 constraints, 30,000 variables, 70,000 on zeros, uh, and it solves trivially in 0.28 seconds. So very easy. And what you get is this kind of uh, output. So the losses, which are here in the positive side, will look like this. And so you have a big concentration of uh, value here at the beginning. Uh, so you'll be earning around 6,000 units. And then you have a long tail distribution uh, that goes up quickly into almost probably the one. But this here, you have a tail, as you can see here. The 5% tail will get you sometimes into the red side. Meaning you'll be, you may be losing money in some possible realizations of this. And what's the average value that you are getting? Sorry, here. Uh, so the average value that you are getting is almost uh, 1,500 units. So it, it's fairly good. But as I was saying, I mean, this solution, although easy to get, it's not really covering uh, the losses. So actually, the largest loss is 1,600, which is about 53% of the average return that we were talking. And maybe in some situations, you really want to limit the exposure to the bad cases. And, and, and you may wonder how to limit that exposure. So one easy thing to do, and that most people will come up with, is the idea of, OK, maybe I should cover against the worst possible return. Uh, so what will be the worst possible return in that plot that we were talking about is this point. It's the point where the probability reaches one and is the farther point to the right in this plot. And if you want to optimize the worst return, what you will be asking for is trying to move this point as much as possible to the left, but only this point. So this is still an LP. It still solves in under a second. And what you will get is what you will guess, essentially this. What we did by optimizing the worst uh, case uh, loss is really collapse the whole distribution into this single point. So now, in every single case, we are getting one value, which is about uh, 500 uh, gains in this case. But, but this is kind of ridiculous. I mean, we're always now winning uh, 540, but the other solution, the expected value solution, was getting on average a 4,600 return, which is way superior. And maybe this is just too conservative. Maybe we could do something different. Maybe instead of trying to get this farther point, uh, maybe we could optimize the 25% worse solution. And that's called the value risk at 11.75. And if you look at the graph for a given uh, solution, what you will be trying to do is look at the, in this case, 80% probability here, community probability, and you will try to get that value and push it as much as you can to the left. That will be optimizing the value risk of level in this example 80. But what we're going to do is actually solve the value risk of level 75%. However, although you can model that, what you're getting now is something called a chance constraint problem. Why is a chance constraint problem? Because now you have to keep track of the probability uh, of the set that you're looking at. And you only want to optimize the 75% probability. So that forces you to actually solve a MIP. So you have to introduce a binary variable for every scenario and keep track if that scenario is taken care of in the counting or not. And it's really a bad MIP. I mean, you can solve it. Uh, and it will take, in this case, 650 seconds or around that value in my laptop. And this is the solution you get. So remember, what we were doing is optimizing the value of risk of level, of level 75. So in this case, it's this point here. And what you did is push it as much as you could to the left. And that's what you were asking the optimization. And I only care about this point in the distribution. So now you're getting a value risk of below 400, which is very nice. But look, what happened with the rest of the distribution? I mean, you are now getting a very long tail. And actually, it's a very ugly tail. Now you have I don't know, around 5 7% probability of losing big time, really big time. Let me show you here. 
So the average profit is better for sure. Now the average profit is 3,600, almost 3,700. The value of risk 75% is of course very high. That's what we were optimizing. So it's no surprise. It's 4,300. However, the worst profit is now 1,600. I mean, it's a negative first 1,600, which means it's an, a positive loss. You are losing money in this amount uh, and with a fairly high probability, 5% and uh, a bit more. And now if you look at the tail of the distribution and you take a, an average of the 10% of the worst 10% tail of the distribution, you're still losing money. So on average, in the 10% case, you're losing 1,100. Only when you start looking at the last 20% tail average profits, you start ga gaining money. And if you compare with the expected value solution, uh, this is, is, is really different. So first of all, sure, you were optimizing now the value risk 75%, and of course you are getting a better value for the value risk. So that makes sense. So it's no surprise that you're getting a better value for that metric because that's what you were optimizing. However, the worst profit is actually worse now. And not only that, I mean, the 10% the, the, the profit the average 10% profit, worst 10% profit is way worse than what you were getting with the simple expected value solution. Uh, so, I mean, this is really pointing that trying to optimize this kind of metrics, is, it may not be a good idea. Actually, this is showing, and this is somewhat typical, that we'll be exposing you to even worse outcomes in, in the really bad scenarios. Uh, so really, if what you want to do is to have a better, way of handling and guarding against bad scenarios, the idea of using these value risk metrics are not that great. And not only that, uh, using value risk is really slow. Is you're solving now a MIP and, and is actually a very bad MIP, I would say. So do we have an alternative for this? And of course we do. And, and, and probably the key thing here is something called the conditional value risk. What's the idea of the conditional value risk? is instead of caring just about this point, the conditional value risk is the average of the tail distribution, is the expected value of the bad outcomes, of the 20% worse outcomes in this case. So the C bar 80% is the, is the expected value uh, of all the outcomes above the 80% bar. So it's the average of this red part, assuming that you are in the bad case. And why is this is important? Because, well, certainly it's helping you to transform a random outcome into a number. And actually, it's not just any measure. The, 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 the continual value risk is really at the heart of something called the coherent risk measures. And the coherent risk measures is one, one of these new developments of the last 20 years. And, and it's defined actually in terms of actions. What's the idea? So if rho is a coherent risk measure, so what you will be asking for is that if you have a random outcome and a given loss for sure, so the risk of the random outcome uh, plus the given loss should be equal to the risk of the combined thing, which makes sense. Also, if you take the risk of two random variables together, that risk cannot be larger than the risk of taking them separately. And the idea here is that by taking uh, random outcomes together, you may hedge. When one goes bad, the other may, good, may be good and the other way around. And that may allow the risk measure to go down, actually. So that's the whole idea of the subjectivity. Also, you'll be asking something called positive homogeneity which essentially says that if I multiply by a given constant, positive constant, a random outcome, then the risk is going to be linear on terms of the original uh, risk of the uh, random outcome, which eh, kind of makes sense. And finally, and this is probably the key thing here, is that you, if you have two random variables and one is below the other, then the risk, of course, should go in the same direction. Meaning that if you have a, a bigger risk, then the valuation of this random outcome should be higher than the risk for a, a, a random variable that is always below the other one. So that makes sense for sure. And as I was saying, the classical example is C var, which is the expected value of the random outcome given that you're above the value of risk of level alpha. So 
again, the picture that we were talking about. But not only that, actually, uh, any mixture of different CVARs are also coherent risk measures. Of course, expected values also are coherent risk measures, and that, that shouldn't surprise us. And, and it's easy to check. I mean, the expected value of something plus a constant is really the expected value of something plus the constant. Actually, there is no subadditivity. You will have equality because the expected value is linear. So that will be trivial also here for the positive uh, values. And given two random variables that are uh, one below the other, of course, the expected value is also going to respect that inequality. So expected value is one of the things that uh, are also current risk measures. So actually, the neutral risk measure for uh, uh, random variables. Well, it's not a coherent risk measure. So the value of risk by itself is not, and, and it's not too hard to see that. And also the Markowitz model, it's not a coherent risk measure. Uh, and it's not too hard to see why it's not the case, because variance is always looking both to the how much jitter you are getting, uh, and not only on, 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 on looking at the bad side of the outcomes. Uh, anyway. Actually, we know a lot more about coherent risk measures. All coherent risk measures are actually a mixture of uh, CVAR, a convex mixture of CVAR. Uh, so that's really saying that CVAR alpha so is, is a base uh, of all the possible coherent risk measures that you may think of. Uh, not only that, the CVAR is can be represented in a very simple way, like a minimization problem like this. And why should you care about that? Well, because essentially this form allows you to put either CVAR in the objective function for a minimization problem or as a constraint. And that's really neat. And, and since it's only an expectation value, it's, it's when you have discrete distribution, this is just a sum. And this is key because essentially for a discrete problem, uh, all this translates back into an LP. So actually, the conditional value risk, if we use conditional value risk of 75% as an objective, the P still solves in under a second. And the model is not much more complicated than what we had before. It's just that line. Oh, and by the way, I didn't say it before. I'm going to release a complete uh, Jupyter node with all the models and all the graphics uh, so you can play with it and, and see what happens by changing all the parameters that you may want to see, OK? And how the solution looks like? Well, the solution looks like this. So it's very surprising. Actually, now you're getting a, almost all the mass of distribution concentrated here. Actually, it's pr probably more than 90% in this little area. And, and you can look at here. Actually, this is the box plot is saying that the expected value is here at the tail, uh, that the 95% probability is really here in this tiny, tiny piece between below the 300 almost. And then you have a tail, uh, a 5% probability tail, but it's not too bad. Um, probably a better way to look at it is compare it against the expected value solution. So what you can see right away is, for example, the CVAR solution has a worse profit smaller than the worst profit on the expected value solution. Not only that, if you look at the tail 10% worse profit, the average tail, uh, you are getting a much better value. So with the CVAR solution, the, the tail uh, average, of the 10% tail average is 2,700, while for the expected value solution is 1,700. And if you look at the tail 20% profit, uh, you get a 30% uh, a 3,100 a value, uh, whereas for the expected value solution, you're getting a 2,400 uh, solution. Sure, you are paying here in the average profit, but that is to be expected. But you are really guarding a bit against these tail things. Uh, but OK, what if we change a little bit the, the, the objective function? What if we now mix not only CVAR, a pure CVAR, but if I do a 50% expected value plus a 50% CVAR 75%. Well, this problem still solves in under a second, and the distribution does change. And if you look at the box plot here, 
Now the average is here and you have a wider distribution of the 50% uh, probability around the expected value. Here you have a wider spread on the 95% probability and actually you have a longer tail and it's also shown here. And if you compare it with the expected value solution, well, now look at the average. I move, we move from the 4,600 uh, average value for the expected value solution to 4,500, which is not a big drop. And now this VAR 75% is actually better than the VAR 75% for the expected value solution. Not only that, the worst profit is also going down. And if you look at the average worst 10% tail of the profits, it's going up too. So this is really, really giving uh, a better feeling on, on how to shape the final uh, distribution. And, and this is really key because remember, I mean, now you can use these kind of things as constraints. And let me show you a comparison between some of the solutions that we were exploring. Uh, so what I have here is in red going below the expected value solution. You have a long tail, as you see, a very smooth distribution. Uh, if you look at the value at risk, 75% is this distribution. And as I was saying, what we did when we were optimizing the value risk is really pushing this point, the 75% value of the distribution all the way to the left, as much as you could. But you end up paying with the tail distribution. And in this case, it's a very bad tail with a big mass probability here at the end. On the other hand, if you look at the CVAR 75 solution, uh, you have a, a smaller range of possible values. Uh, the tail is nicer and shorter, as, as, as is shown in this example, than the expected value. And of course, much better than the value at risk 75% solution. And, and probably this is also better shown in this box plot comparison of all the five solutions that we were looking at. So the expected value solution uh, is somewhat concentrated here. So the 50% uh, probability is around here, the expected value. Here you have the 95% and then a somewhat long tail. Now, the worst case solution is really a collapse point. You, what you did was really push this realization as much as you could down, and then you collapse the whole distribution to a single point. But probably this is way too much conservative in this situation and in probably most situations. Now, the value at risk, what it did is to collapse actually a whole lot of the probability here in this point, in this worst, uh, actually the 75% uh, value for the uh, distribution. But the price that you paid is that the tail of the distribution is really huge, actually larger than the tail on the expected value solution. Not only that, if you want to look at the 95% uh, distribution, sorry, you have to take into account even the worst the outcome that you had. Whereas what you did with CVAR 75% is really, first of all, to concentrate over 50% of the probability here around the, expect, the, the, the expected value for this solution. And now just moving a little bit up, you get the 95% of all the realizations here, very close to the expected value. And then a shorter tail, a 5% tail. And if you look at the solution that you get by using a mixture between the expected value and the CVAR, you actually are in between these two box plots. So you have a wider range, still is more concentrated than the expected value, but less concentrated than the, 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 the CVAR, and you have a bit longer of a tail. Uh, and if you look at the quantiles here, this is what you get. So the value risk, if you look at the CVAR 90%, you are losing money. And in the CVAR 95%, you're losing money. Uh, if you look at the expected values here, so of course the expected value solution has the best expected value because that's what you were optimizing. But looking here at this mixture in the objective between expected and CVAR, it's not really far away from what you had before. The worst is really boring. Everything is just the same. Uh, and as I was saying here, Moving from the CVAR 75 to the expected value of CVAR, you are losing some hedging on the bad cases, as you see. But what you gain is a better value on expected uh, terms. 
So what's the right combination? Well, that's the beauty of it. Actually, you get to decide what's the best uh, value. So uh, let me finish up. So the last thing that I haven't talked yet about is what to do on the case of general distributions, uh, meaning what to do when your problem has not a discrete distribution. And the surprising thing and nice thing at the same time is that actually sampling is enough. Uh, under very general conditions. Now, what do I mean by that? Suppose that you have a given problem P and you take a sample of the problem of a given size. Then you're going to get a PI problem. And why I put a hat there? Because this problem is really a random variable depending on the actual sample that I took. And it turns out that the optimal value for a minimization problem of the stochastic problem is always going to be bigger than or equal than the expected value of this sample problem. So there is some small bound bias is called. Also, you have convergence. As you make the, the, the sample size grow, this will converge uh, into the value of the optimal problem. Not only that, for any given optimal solution, you know that when you evaluate an optimal, a, a feasible solution, you will get for a minimization problem a value that is above the optimal solution. So this allows you to really get confident intervals, both for the given solution that you have, and by building an interval confidence for the expected value of these sample problems and a, a, a confidence interval for the value of the given kind of solution that you have, you have a good estimation on where the true optimal value for your given problem is. So that's really neat. Uh, this is what is called the sample average approximation method. Uh, some of these techniques uh, on, on how to build bounds uh, date from the late 90s. And, and I think I'm done with this presentation.